it's good to be here. It feels really good to be back here. Um, huge, huge thank you to the organizers of this year's B-Star A presentations and to the studio at large for inviting me to be everyone's host MC here tonight. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Paul Pung. I was a student here. I graduated in 2017 through the BCSA program. And I didn't attend, well, I attended, I did attend the first BSTAR A presentations back in 2014. I didn't present in them, but I did present in the next three. And being back here um, with a mic in my hand for the fourth time after uh, many years of not being here, of instead um, being a real person in the world, I guess, um, I think the most immediate thing I feel is just um, a lot of excitement to hear um, our seven presenters tonight and the sorts of things that they have to share. Um, when I first um, signed up to present in the second BSTAR A uh, presentations to ever happen, I was very much under the mindset of like, oh, this has to be a really um, solid, like comprehensive, traditional, um, our talk that captures everything about what I do, what I did and want to do. And that talk can be that. Um, several of our presenters tonight have talks that are that. Um, but what I think is special about um, the BSTAR A presentations in comparison to maybe um, more formal um, structures of presentations is the presenters having the option to choose whether or not they want to do that, to choose whether they want to go for this um, standard, here's everything about me, or take a step back and just be like, here is a specific thing that I have been really focusing on for the past six months, one year, two years, and am just, just want to share my knowledge of you with it, not necessarily offering like this grander narrative about how it plays into my identity as an art or artist or a person, but just share a little bit of knowledge with you. Or maybe that knowledge hasn't really come together yet, but there's this and that and those things that I've um, just been thinking about. Um, and I wanna share that with you. So you're seeing less of like one particular image of an artist's um, practice and more so the weird soup that that practice might arise from or something else might arise from. Or you might get something other than those things. Anyways, um, instead of talking about the talks tonight, I think it's time to let the talks tonight start to happen. So without further ado, Starting things off with a bang, we have our first presenter of the evening, Anastasia Jungol, um, giving us an overview about um, the things that have been informing um, their, their interests as an artist and as a person through the lens of Kish. Without further ado, here comes Anastasia Jungol. Give it up. I was gonna say I still don't know how to work this microphone and I refuse to learn how because I am used to the video camera, the end. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Love ya. Okay, um, so last time I did this, I kind of did cover my entire art practice and it was, thank you for the timer, that's gonna scare the hell out of me. Um, way too much information. It was way too much. So today I'm just gonna talk about kitsch and I actually have this beautiful little object that my friend Annika Weber gave me like 10 minutes before this started. They had no idea that this is what I was talking about, so it's fantastic. Um, more specifically, flowers and ceramics and puppies and kitties and the like. Um, so 
a few months ago, Andrew Johnson advised me to read this essay by Clement Greedberg. Um, I, I think it's just called Avant-Garde and Kitsch. Um, and he makes all of these points that are kind of very pro-avant-garde. This is like a very outdated essay and very anti-kitsch. Um, and I don't necessarily side with him, but it did kind of make me reconsider how we define kitsch, um, because it's just sort of this like word that doesn't really need a definition. You say kitsch, people know what kitsch is. This is very clearly kitsch. Um, hummels are a big thing that comes to mind. Um, hummels are actually made, something I found out in this is that hummels are produced, designed, and the color palette is picked by like one specific nun when she passed the production and color palette choice and et cetera was passed on to her convent. So just like a little interesting thing. These are very kind of like classic kitschy things and that's why. So I found these three essential conditions for kitsch written by Thomas Kolka. And those kind of helped me like, again, consider how we define it because in some sense these are very like broad rules. Um, but the thing that we're talking about, like the depicted subject is instantly and effortlessly identifiable and things like that. Made me think of like, again, really obvious, like Thomas Kincaid. Um, this one is actually called Nature's Paradise, which I think is so funny because it's like, th this is Nature's Paradise. I mean, come on, there's like the deer, there's the canoe, you know, it's paradise. Also makes me think of these kind of like ceramic objects um, that are like typical representations of things. Uh, you know, there's like, some unicorns, a happy bird, a happy little baby doll, Mary Magdalene, something like that. And then also like this idea of like accumulating objects, um, both like accumulating objects that are kitsch, but the accumulation being kitsch. And then this is from Greenberg's essay, and he has this like very specific outline for what kitsch is. Or it's like a set of examples. Um, I'm not gonna read most of these things. Uh, but that also was really interesting to me because it's like such a specific definition, but again, they're all just like so clearly in this kind of broad definition of what kitsch is. So I decided to make my own little definitions. So here's my specific list. Um, so I have anything ornate, aluminum, or painted with a fine brush, anything colored with a palette more or less delicate than that which a cubist painter would use, AstroTurf, Coca-Cola memorabilia, vintage Zippo lighters, plastic baby dolls and kittens and bonnets, product placement, superhero movies, art students that take pictures of roadkill, atheism, religion, single-celled lines of thought, and the belief that we are better than our neighbors. And that was kind of like, <laughs> I was thinking about it a little bit as like me fighting against Greenberg because I think he kind of has like this very old man definition of how to define things. Um, which kind of inspired the thought of line of like, or the, the line of thought that like any of these like single celled ideas, such as like atheism or religion, are kind of kitsch in the sense that it's just like not a broad understanding of the world. It's like this, this is what it is, and it's that thing. Um, and then this is actually from Kandera's book, The Unbearable Lightness of Being. Um, and kind of, again, going back to like the broad versus specific definition, I thought that this quote was really interesting because it kind of like encompasses a lot more than just kitsch itself. Um, Kundera's book is like kind of terrible and like sexist and it like speaks generally kind of negatively on the concept of kitsch. Um, but I think it's like a fun quote and it affirms just this general like digestible universality that Kitsch pre presents, which is kind of just like a neutral force in the world when it's like at such a small scale. Um, so this is all just to say, like, I'm not here to make any new claims or like <laughs> try to like fight some like really old art critic who just like hated Kitsch and loved the avant garde and like didn't really know any better. Um, I just kind of want to be like, you know, let's face it, Kitsch is charming. It's fun. Like, who doesn't love things like this? Um, I think it like, is interesting to consider like how it applies to larger concepts, but that's not really like the complete focus of this. And um, last semester, I created a series of like kitsch objects. Um, I was in a ceramics class and I was having a lot of fun with like image transferring stuff and like, I don't know, kind of like abstracting <laughs> what kitsch looks like. Um, and I actually have like a little, I'm gonna do a little giveaway 
So if anybody is interested in like being part of this, if you could just raise your hand now and I'll come give you like a number and then come meet me at the end of the talk and we'll kind of handle that. Okay, so I'm done, but I'm gonna come around and give numbers. <laughs> Anastasia, is it okay if I, um, great, you know I got one of those numbers. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Anastasia, for that wonderful talk, for giving us um, a view of this, um, this notion that um, has really captured your interest at the moment. Do you need this back? Of course. Um, yeah, I think it's very, um, it's a good strategy to look into, or not necessarily to go out of your way to look into, but when you're kind of confronted by, I guess, more oppressive frameworks of the past, frameworks like uh, Clement Greenberg's notion of kitsch versus the avant-garde, to not necessarily always be forced to choose one side or the other, but instead to just um, take them and appreciate them uh, for what they are, almost like bootlegging them from their intended uses into um, those of your own, not necessarily um, driven by some higher duty, but by your sheer enjoyment of them regardless of what they were originally intended for. Our next presenter um, will be giving us um, a good overview of who they are as an artist and what they care about, I suppose. Um, coming up next is Scott Liu. Um, so without further, ado, bleh, without further ado, give him a round of applause. Maybe? Okay, yeah. So, in the next six minutes, I'm gonna spend the majority of the time overcoming my stage fright and remain subconscious because instead of giving intelligent information, I thought it's just gonna be a self introduction. So, how do I move? Ah, yeah. So, I'm a BFA student in the School of Fine Art, class of 2026. My name is Scott. I kill the time a little bit. And um, here's a um, bunch of stuff I made. So I started painting after I come to college, actually. And then I just was interested in ex exploring different themes and different medias, which I don't have a very strong focus right now. But I just like to fuck around and find out. And there's like some recent works. Um, Latest ones go back to last year before summer, and here's a here's like a triptych, which I made recently because I'm kind of exploring on how to create a narrative through triptychs, different panels, a group of combination of imageries, and this actually have a um, a reference from an Inuit fairy tale, which I usually do because I think. Getting some inspirations from fairy tales and folklores, also literatures. So I've one of my interests since I was very young, and I would draw characters or things I see through the media I consumed. And this is like a representation of what I can transform into. And yeah, it's actually just homework. And our uh, next one is also more triptychs that's more that more recently. Um, exploring like just some really pers uh, personal emotions and also like can I read it? No, it says silence now or do uh, everything you build is just it's all for show and the last one is just princesses door period and um, this is like some materials built in the class by Clayton Merrill and I think that's something it, it, it makes sense for you to wake up to go to at 8 p.m. I mean 8 a.m. So it's really helpful and really fun to do. So I was just also exploring more medias, like for example, can you do watercolor? 
uh, on top of oil pens. Answer is you cannot. It's gonna die in like 10 years, but whatever. And there's more works also done in Clayton, Clayton Merrill's class, all more like traditional gessos and traditional wood panels that you build yourself. And this encaustic is basically just made of wax. And uh, I came up with this idea after like, doodling 20 pages into your sketchbook in one day. And then 10 p.m., you just kind of be like, I've done 20 pages, I'm tired now. Um, so I have a project that's coming up tomorrow. What am I going to do? And then there you go, salt pillar. Uh, that's the one on the left. So it's also inspired by Greek mythology, in a sense, but it's just myself working on a working habit, for example. If you want to come up with uh, with one idea, you can turn it into a piece of work. You might need to just go for it, do doodles all day, and after 26 pages, you'll find out. And um, this is some relief prints and entangled works. It's like done from our new Professor Haley's uh, printmaking classes, which make us just explore multiple medias and whatever theme you can you are interested in. It just doesn't have a theme. It doesn't have a prompt. And you can just do whatever. And I find that really interesting. And it kind of just encourage, uh, personally encourage me to do whatever I want to do. So that's great. And uh, next one is just more 2D works. I really didn't prepare for this crap. <laughs> OK, so uh, after this one, here's some 3D works. It's also just more like stuff other medias I'm interested in, like building some kind of realistic sculptures, small sculptures, and um, this this one beneath is actually kind of interesting because it's just based on my memories when I was a kid. And there's like objects that doesn't really belong to me, but they are, they kind of reminds me of the memories in my own experience. So that was an inspir inspiration and just a lot of fun to build. And uh, puppet making, small sculptures, and stop motion animations, these are kind of like medias I consume throughout my childhood. And it's just something that really keeps me going because it's interesting. And also photography as a hobby, film photography. Like taking black and white photography really help you to develop uh, your understanding to physical medias for photography. And uh, color is just, color photography is just for fun. Oh, that's scaring me. So I'm just going to keep going. And um, see, street phot photography is super despicable. You just take a picture of a person on the street and you have no consent to, which is actually legal, to my surprise. And um, just for fun, some hobby as a photography person. Don't call me a photography person. I'm just joking. That's not it. But yeah, that's all I have. Thank you, Scott. Um, real quick, um, every time I come up here with the mic, I always have um, a little moment of panic because the light on the mic that determines whether um, it is muted or not um, is the exact shade of orange and the exact shade of green that my color blindness cannot tell the difference between. <laughs> so every time I come up here is with a press of a button and a prayer. And so far, God has been on my side. Shout outs to God. Thank you. Um, anyways, thank you for that talk, Scott. Um, it's always, I don't know, when I was uh, searching for schools to go to, um, I think what attracted um, me to um, CMU's art program in particular is the way in which it gives you that freedom to do um, whatever you want, even before you know what you want. Um, I think um, with our first two talks tonight, we have um, two formats that can be kind of um, pitted against each other. Anastasia's more deep dive into one specific thing versus Scott's more um, wide sweeping. This is kind of everything. But they're, both of those formats are really unified by that um, fundamental notion of uh, people here getting to do whatever they want in the way that they want it and however um, it turns out. And we get to see all the different ways um, that turns out, whether it is this um, 
kind of um, broad sweeping uh, summary, or not even necessarily a summary, but an unapologetic, um, I do this and that and that and that and that, or a more fixated, um, this is one of the things that I do. Um, speaking of fixations, our next presenter tonight, um, I think we'll have a lot um, to share with us about a certain flowering plant. Um, without further ado, I bring to the stage Bethany Huang. Give it up. Hi, I'm Bethany. I'm a current sophomore in the BFA program. Um, that's me. <laughs> Um, so for those of you who actually do know me, will probably know that I love flowers. Um, they're just kind of like everywhere. Like I have it on my body, I have it on my sketchbook, in my work, kind of literally everywhere. But I am very much fixated on these flowers. And yeah, I kind of wanted to talk about that. So we go way back to my grandmother, love her. Um, RP queen, but she was a florist. Um, and growing up, my parents were ve very busy, and I was very much just raised by my grandmother. And we would always talk about flowers, and we would go take walks, and basically we would see these forsythias everywhere. Um, I'm from Seoul, South Korea, by the way, and forsythias are very much everywhere. They're just kind of like um, roadside shrubs that you see. They're very mundane. And as a young child, knowing that my grandmother was a florist, I kind of assumed that every single flower on this planet Earth was arranged by her, <laughs> that, and that she would wake up like at the butt crack of dawn to like arrange all these flowers in the roads. And when we would go take walks, I would ask her if she had arranged these four Scythias overnight. And she would always play along with it. Um, and yeah, she, like I said, passed away in 2021 when COVID, COVID was, was at its peak. And then I kind of started thinking about what that meant to me. Like that was the first time when a very critical part of my life kind of disappeared. So I started processing that through my art. And so I started by just kind of making these drawings. It started out as like very kind of like impulsive drawings and direct representation of these flowers. Um, and started doing more iterations and started taking up more space. Um, these were, it looks very small on the screen, but it was a pretty big, um, like pretty big pa like papers stuck together. I would say it's like, it would take up an entire wall. And then, Going from 2D to more 3D, I started kind of arranging the, these flowers. I have no background in floral arrangement, <laughs> um, but kind of made this arch and uh, wrote it in charcoal. Um, it's in Korean, but it translates into the meaning of life prevails despite the disappearance of existence. Um, because if you think about it, kind of like, Knowing that something's not there also immediately means that it was there and you're kind of missing it and you're kind of wanting to fill that void. Um, and then I was in Andrew Johnson's risk agency failure class and this was part of my final, um, this, is, this was a class I took last spring and for context for Scythias are a spring flower and I've only seen them in Korea, so I was like really sad that I would never see them again, kind of, until I realized they do bloom here in Pittsburgh, and I was so, so happy. Like, like I was just like overflowing with joy. And then I kind of wanted to do like an homage of like how the, the blooming of these flowers kind of symbolize her reincarnation, because she passed away like right at the end of um, 2021, so like December. And then spring would come around and it's like, 
she's back here again, and then I would see her every year, kind of, and she's always around me. So these are inflatables, and the palette was made by me, and inflatables were also made by me. <laughs> these are some stills, and I have a video to kind of like show like what it does. So it, um, it's kind of an homage to like the last time I saw her. Like I said, COVID was at its peak, and when she was in um, the hospital, the last time I saw her, she was unconscious and breathing really hard, and she had this like very specific rhythm of breathing. So I kind of wanted to play that with the imagery of flowers like blooming and then wilting, kind of, and the minutes like the intervals are in the exact intervals that she was breathing. But yeah, it's an inflatable. Um, oh, stop playing. Oh no, I'm sorry. But that's about it. Um, those are my <laughs> hyperspectation on Four Sophia's. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Bethany. That was an incredibly touching presentation. I think it's always really easy to take for granted when you just hear it as a generalism. Oh, um, people's personal histories inform like what they do, the type of art they make, and so on and so forth. But I think it's a real treat to for um, someone like Bethany to come up here and actually show um, one way that that specifically looks like. And um, just to show how her own personal history and um, her own um, familial history um, develops into um, a really important part of her practice, a part that's equally personal, private, and public. Um, for this next uh, presenter and their presentation, um, we look at um, not necessarily a personal history, but a more public history, although there's plenty of um, the personal in it, um, specifically a public history on art and activism in Pittsburgh through the Sunrise Movement here. Um, our next presenter, Ilyas Khan, um, please step forward, um, give it up. Thank you. Uh, I like the idea of being a preventer of climate change. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take that. Um, so my name is Ilyas Khan. Um, I am a sophomore uh, in the BXA program. Uh, my X is linguistics and my A is fine arts. Um, but I don't do any of that for my day job, uh, which seems a little strange, I'm sure. Um, instead, I dedicate all of my spare waking hours to artivism and the process of making public policy and local uh, uh, justice change through art and direct political engagement. Um, and this is the organization uh, that I work with, Sunrise Movement Pittsburgh. So uh, first off, like a little brief history of art activism in the city of Pittsburgh and the surrounding area. Um, Pittsburgh, since its inception, has been um, sort of at the center of a lot of the political movements of the United States. Um, on the far right, my right, your left, um, you'll see a, a, a script for a song sung at the Homestead Strike, uh, which was broken up by ours truly, Andrew Carnegie, uh, in 1892 down in Homestead. Um, Twelve people were killed in that strike, but this pamphlet of this song that was sung by the striking workers down there has survived through the, through the decades. Um, believe it or not, uh, Woody Guthrie wrote a song about uh, uh, environmental decline and health hazards in the city of Pittsburgh in 1941, and it was sung by Pete Seeger. It's recorded right there on that record. It's called Pittsburgh, Oh Lord, Pittsburgh. Um, very recently, just at uh, uh, um, the Carnegie, uh, we've had Unsettling Matter Gaining Ground, um, which was curated by two uh, uh, faculty members here at CMU, 
um, another great example of local artists and activists coming together to discuss issues of land use, environmental degradation, um, and, and climate justice and injustice as a whole. And then on the far right here, uh, if you haven't had a chance to go see it, this is in Homewood. This is called the Liberty Wall, and it sort of tracks uh, a history of movements, or the Liberation Wall, I'm sorry, uh, uh, the history of, of movements of, of public liberation um, over, over the decades. Um, you know, you see a Black Panther there, um, and a number of other, I think Muhammad Ali is in there. I can't really see from here. Um, but a number of other figures who all sort of played roles in liberation. Um, Sunrise Movement Pittsburgh, though, as an organization, is not just an art-focused thing. Um, it's a youth uh, organization designed as explicitly to get young people engaged in local decision-making. Um, so whether that's like bursting into city council meetings to say, this is a really terrible law, um, or taking up streets, or writing legislation, all kinds of things. Um, and it's existed since 2019 as part of the National Sunrise Movement, um, but really on a local level, we focus much more on local issues. Um, and here's, here's some of my own work that I've done since I've been a part of Sunrise Movement Pittsburgh um, that's also reflective of my personal uh, uh, um, life and work as both an artist uh, uh, and an activist. Um, on the left uh, is about uh, the floods in Pakistan. In the middle, I wore a horrifying blonde wig um, to play an evil oil baron in a comedy show. Um, a series of flyers and prints um, that have all been made for various uh, protests and actions. This one's still a sketch. Um, so our engagement with art activism through Sunrise Movement Pittsburgh comes in a lot of forms. Some of the previous ones are, are ones that I've done, but there's a lot of organizations that we work with that kind of push the boundaries of what is activism and what is art in this kind of intersectional space. Um, we have on the right here, uh, that's Ted Everhart. He is a singer-songwriter who comes to protests and sings and songs. Um, but we also have uh, folks who build banners um, recently out here at the Walking to the Sky. Uh, just had a charity art sale the other day. All kinds of stuff is happening constantly um, to engage uh, uh, local artists and local decision makers um, uh, uh, through the creative process. Um, and people may wonder what exactly you can do with uh, art activism uh, in what might feel like a dead end city like Pittsburgh sometimes. Um, and I can assure you directly that uh, we've had a lot of amazing moments um, where we've directly engaged policymakers with art uh, at this event that I'm seen speaking at. Um, there was someone who came in and did a comedy sketch in front of Allegheny County Council uh, to demand that they vote on a bill. Uh, and it passed, it worked. Um, but there's all kinds of protest art. Uh, we use art as a form of movement building, but also as a form of healing um, in our movements. You know, uh, whatever kind of liberation you're fighting for, odds are art is a way that you process uh, your own struggles um, and other kinds of remediation and forming connection uh, with land, uh, material, community, and more. Uh, um, Unsettling Grounds is a, a fantastic example of that that we can actually go see tomorrow. Um, so yeah, uh, that is my spiel, um, and if you want to do the same thing I do, uh, you can join me and make evil climate propaganda and we can do it together, it'll be lots of fun. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Elias. Yeah, it's really um, easy to especially when you're in a bubble like the CMU School of Art to just be surrounded by it all the time that you just kind of forget that it actually has real power in the real world. So it's always nice to get a real reminder of that. I'm very happy to hear that um, a bill passed um, through a comedy sketch in favor of it. Um, our next presenter um, will be sharing with us her art practice and specifically 
uh, within our art practice a computational exploration of the um, unyielding enigma and enigmatic form that is known as a blob. Uh, coming up is Lori Chen. Give it up. My anxiety is actually through the roof right now, so I'm just going to go and attempt to get started. Okay, so blobs. Hi everyone, I'm Lori, I'm a sophomore. I'm probably gonna be studying CSNR and I'm gonna talk about my blobs. So I really did peak in high school. I, <laughs> I think I made pretty good work back then, back then, back in the day. Um, but I think that really started to change when I entered university. I think I started making really shitty work, as you can see by these blank and unfinished and incomplete sketches. Um, <laughs> this was my first blob. Um, I only really started like getting introduced to blobs through from like last semester when I took a creative coding class with Golan, and this was my first blob exploration. Pretty shitty. Um, second attempt number two, second blob, I think I found a little more success. It, I used a physics library and some algorithms to calculate this blob shape and you can interact with it. Not exactly the most aesthetically pleasing, but at the time it was very technically challenging for me to like actually do this and I was really proud of myself for that. I continued with some of the algorithms I used in the last project and this one. Um, it's my attempt to iterate on what I've done in the past. Um, not really good. Again, kind of shitty. And then I failed. Um, this was a failed blob attempt. I wanted to, for like an assignment in the Drawing with Machines course I'm taking right now, um, we had an assignment where we were taking something from raster to vector, and I wanted to use reaction diffusion half toning to do that. I did not plan my time well, and I failed, um, so I had to go a different direction and use stars instead. And I, yeah, it's kind of messy, not really proud of it, but this did make me realize I had to change, um, so I did. This was the result of like change in workflow. Um, I worked a bit more on my time management skills, I iterated more, and then I also did ask for help, which was very much like really needed. Um, the process for the previous plot was um, this. Um, this was not, this is not what it's supposed to look like. I had a really interesting bug and then I had to spend a lot of time fixing it. When I did fix it, um, I got something that looked like this. Uh, it's reaction to fusion with a sort of like contour finding all the algorithm that Ling Dong actually made and Golan showed me, so I used that. Um, here's some detail shots of like the plot all the way on the left from like two slides ago. Um, I did a lot of like like exploration with the material quality of like plotting and like inks. So like pen plotters can basically draw the same thing many times. So that's exactly what I did, and I kind of screwed with them by plotting many layers of using different color inks and then periodically just like putting my fi like finger there and like lifting the pen so that I wouldn't draw for like a section. And then I would did that for like, uh, like 10 colors. I spent a lot of time in the studio to like get this. And I think the layering aspect is pretty cool and I really wanted to make the reaction diffusion look like mold, which it doesn't exactly look like mold, but I'm glad that it's colorful at the very least. I decided to continue to iterate on my previous ideas. Um, I want to keep going with the reaction diffusion because I don't think I was very successful. If anything, I think the last exploration was kind of a failure because it didn't achieve what I wanted to, it to achieve. But I continue by fixing the frame rate issue that I have with the last one. You couldn't see, but in the GIF of like the buggy reaction diffusion version, the frame rate were at, was actually like in the single digits, which 
not good because it meant I had to sit there and wait for the reaction diffusion to diffuse for like three hours to get an interesting shape. Um, shout out to Golan for giving me a four hour crash course on open frameworks last Friday because it's really difficult to learn because there isn't a lot of documentation and everyone should be documenting their work. Um, yeah. These are some more explorations with like kind of the same program with some values like fiddled with, changed. Um, I also did a little bit of like exploration with how like a user could interact with the reaction diffusion to make more interesting shapes and like perhaps even create a tiny like drawing. Like I think you can see on the mm, left, on the left, on the left GIF. Um, that's like a mouse being dragged around, around the screen to create more spawn points for the reaction diffusion to start. And yeah, I'm not gonna keep going into the algorithm. I'm gonna stop there. Um, here's some more blobs. Uh, this is iterating more on like the previous two slides. Um, here I did something. I analyzed pixel values of an image and then it mm, changed the reaction diffusion sort of like feed and kill values based on that. And I also did some work on like categorizing each blob based on its characteristics, like if it's a hole or if it's has like an area of like, oh, big, oh, oops. I have a, okay. Um, these are my reaction diffusion SVGs exports from the couple of previous slides. These are the plots. This is a test plot of like layering uh, glitter ink on a lot. Um, I also did many more iterations because I learned from my mistakes and I learned that I need to make a lot of work. Wrapping things up, I did a lot of reading to kind of change my workflow. And I think to wrap up and share my thoughts about my journey with blobs, um, I think first and foremost, I want to say that I am by no means satisfied with my current work. If anything, the last couple of slides are like progress. I, th I think of it as progress. Um, but I did learn through blobs that I have to genuinely like learn things with the perspective of being an amateur and to not bring my e own ego into my progress in learning about new projects. So. Yeah, blobs really taught me a lot, and thanks. I really hope you saw that I learned something from blobs. Thank you. All right. OK. Thank you, Lori, for that wonderful um, overview of your newfound and exciting explorations of all the things you can do with blobs. Um, I think um, when, before I saw that, before the talk happened, when I just saw like the brief summaries that were given to me of each talk um, tonight, I thought it was going to be kind of like a, this is how you like peek inside a blob and like break it apart and stuff like that. So it's actually really um, refreshing to see kind of like the opposite approach where it's sort of like, we're accepting that a blob is a blob. And a blob doesn't have to be anything but a blob. But let's see what it does. Um, and I think it's easy to, again, like kind of like put those two things together, understanding something in terms of what it is and understanding something in terms of what it does. It's easy to see those as kind of like in opposition to each other. But when you really start getting into one, you find that you find yourself um, kind of accidentally stumbling into the other when you start um, chasing. Um, the one enough. I think an example of that could be um, I don't know, just, just in the way when you study one thing, you begin to see how it's part of another thing. Like for example, in biology, there's this notion um, of how the little uh, parts of a cell came together. They didn't just grow out of that cell. They were instead through like other smaller bacteria coming into that cell. And if that 
sounds like a weirdly specific thing to be talking about right now, it is because I am trying my best to transition into the next speaker's topic. Um, and the next speaker is M. Lugo, who will be giving us a little more insight on that process I described, termed endosymbiosis, and a little bit about the visionary thinker who introduced um, that term to modern biology. Give it up for M. Lugo. Howdy, I'm M. Howdy. So I'm here to talk about the endosymbiotic theorist and what it really, um, the history of biology going against Darwinian thought. Um, to kind of make sure we're all a little bit on the same page, let's talk about the, hinder, the history of, endo, of symbiogenesis theory. Um, in the late 18th century, Russian scientists were looking under a microscope at cells and were able to kind of intuit that uh, s structures like mitochondria and chloroplasts are very similar to bacteria, prokaryotes, that do not have organelles inside of them that necessarily produce energy. Um, and so they, they posited that uh, eukaryotic life as we know it, or life with uh, organelles within it, are essentially constructed of these bacteria-like structures. This was abandoned entirely for a couple decades. Um, because it was thought to be so far away from the ideas of evolution that it could not possibly be true. Fast forward to 1967, um, the paper on the origin of mitosing cells by Lim Margulis was published. It uh, kind of proposes the idea that a eukaryotic cell over here, like an animal or plant cell, um, is constructed of an ancient merger of prokaryotic bacteria that found it so useful to be together that they kind of become one organism. This was uh, initially got a lot of controversy when it was published because it was the same kind of idea of this is so far away from ideas of neo-Darwinism that it is impossible to, and all life is a random mutation. Um, I have another image of it, but it was not an easy road for Lynn to kind of publish this paper. Um, it was denied 15 times before it was published in the Journal of Theoretic Biology, the Theoretical Biology by Boston University and it was very highly contested in its time. Um, and people were making claims such that the DNA structure of uh, organelles within eukaryotes is just a coincidence, or it's a happenstance of kind of evolution converging. This, they were wrong. <laughs> Essentially, um, partial proof came in the 70s and 80s when people were actually trying to test Lin's theory and see if it was true. Um, this paper, Origins of Prokaryotes and Eukaryotes, Mitochondria and Chloroplasts, kind of provides the first concrete evidence that we can link um, eukaryotic life as a sort of merger or amalgamation of prokaryotic life. Um, but as I said before, this was a very difficult thing to get across in its time and was not really recognized until the 70s and 80s. With this discovery and m many, many hundreds more papers using endosymbiosis as a theory, both in philosophy and the life sciences, Margulis received a lot of praise publicly. She received the National Medal of Science from Bill Clinton in 1999, the Darwin-Wallace Medal, and a number of books with her son, uh, Dorian Sagan, um, and as well as a long-standing career at uh, UMass Amherst and Boston University. Um, but Margulis was interested in controversy. Margulis was an alternative thinker to the rest, and that's why she got where she was. She thought differently. Um, so I'm here to talk actually about some of the more controversial hypotheses she, the more controversial hypotheses she supported. First, here, which I consider the least controversial, is Gaia hypothesis. With uh, atmospheric chemist Jeremy Lovelock, she created the idea of the Gaia hypothesis that the Earth is a combination of living and non-living things, and in fact, we can treat it as a single organism that is keeping itself in balance. Um, but it was, that itself is a very controversial idea in saying that life exists not out of some great coincidence, but because it had to exist based off of any form of life happening. Life happening. Um, I'd say this is least controversial because I think um, 
this kind of points towards Gaia, the god, the goddess, and is using science as a way to point to religion. Then we get on to some of her more controversial beliefs that she supported. In 2008, she came out with a paper um, that essentially tried to introduce the idea that uh, HIV is not the cause of AIDS, when in fact, in 1983, we've, we've been able to visualize and perceive that HIV is the cause of AIDS. In her theory, a spirochete, a kind of microorganism as seen above, uh, there's an invisible spirochete inside, like, in the world around us that is invisible, that is actually causing um, syphilis that is ending in immunocompromise. Very like dismissive of the current science at the time and is trying to essentially question things <laughs> that, had, that were going against research um, to be controversial. And in this line of controversy, she kind of did her own research into 9-11. Um, in 2004, when the NIST released reports on 9-11, she was skeptical. And she said, certainly, 19 young Arab men and a man in a cave 7,000 miles away, no matter the level of their anger, could not have masterminded and carried out 9-11, the most effective television commercial in the history of Western civilization. She was way out of her wheelhouse. And in this interview, uh, she kind of introduces herself first with all of her accolades. I've been right before. Am I not right about this? Um, and particularly, she was interested in Building 7 of the World Trade Center and was saying that it was pre-planted explosives um, and that because there was removal of rubble, we can now do no analysis. Um, this is all to conclude kind of the story of someone who got, saw benefit and saw the like something good come out of being an, a different thinker, an alternative away from the mainstream, but her efforts kind of spiraled her into, con into conspiracy many times. Um, she was a beloved professor and teacher and person in biology, but it kind of ended up turning on her in her later years. And in her own words, I don't consider myself controversial. I consider them. I don't consider my ideas controversial. I consider them right. Um, I don't know. I just thought it was an interesting story to share. So, thank you, M. I told y'all she was a visionary. <laughs> All right. So it looks like we have but one more presenter tonight. Um, Daria will. Up uh, there. Sorry, Daria will be. Um, shaking things up a little bit in that she will be performing some Max MSP machinations for us tonight. How much time do you need to set up? Uh, All right, I can stall. Um, so um, this Wednesday, um, I had to drive out of town um, for most of the day, um, I had an appointment in Buffalo to get my passport renewed in person because um, I need to fly out of the country tomorrow for a week. Um, the appointment itself went very smoothly, but something very my bad something very strange happened to this mic. Um, but something very strange happened to me um, on my way back from that appointment. Um, I was like halfway back, I was say I was around where around Erie, um, and I needed to um, take a bathroom break. Um, so I pull off the nearest exit, I try to find like the closest public restroom. The closest public restroom is just like a small bank um, off the side of one of the roads. So I go into the bank, I'm like, starts asking the security guard at the front, hey, where's the bathroom? Before I can even finish the sentence, he just like waves me over. So it's like, okay, they've dealt with people like me before. Um, I go to the bathroom, I walk up to the urinal, I unzip my pants, and as I'm halfway through the deed, I look up and realize that there is a security camera right there, pointed right where my junk would be and is in that moment. And so I finished my business, because it's really hard to stop your business halfway through. I would have if I could have. But 
I'm a little pissed. So I wash my hands as quickly as possible, and I storm back out, and I go up to the security bar, and I'm like, excuse me, there's a security camera in the bathroom right on top of the urinal. Isn't that such an invasion of privacy? And he just looks at me and is like, didn't you see the sign in front? This is a PNC bank. I got that joke as a kid from a Christian sports camp. Are you ready? All right, without further ado, Darius Scott. Actually, I forgot I muted my mic, but it's on now. Hi, guys. I'm very nervous, so we will see what I remember for my practice demonstration for tonight. Um, I just really wanted to talk to you guys uh, about Max a little bit and like, uh, I just think it's a really flexible program. It was like really hard to get into, but uh, I've been looking into it for about a year now, and I'm like kind of gaining my grounding in it and like finding what I like about the software. Um, Max is actually a software that was initially made for audio engineers and just musicians uh, to be able to make whatever they wanted to make. It was like for experimental things. So you can make like synthesizers in Max. You can make like audio visual, like visuals like in Max. You can like speak to different computers and different programs. There's like MIDI capabilities. There's like so many things that you can do with Max. And um, tonight I just want to talk about like, I guess how it's enveloped itself into my practice um, because I'm actually like, I really love performing and like, I don't know, uh, I guess like finding something that can help me do that and like an experimental way uh, was great. Uh, I didn't think <laughs> that it would work out the way that it did. Um, and thanks to the studio, they gave me a micro grant to allow me to have Ableton, which has Max for Live capabilities. And I've been able to experiment with just like how I can do more performing. So thanks to the first grant and the studio for that. Um, and so I'm going to start off my demonstration with just talking a little bit about what I'll be doing. Um, so essentially, I just am going to make like one oscillator. And um, so to do that, you just like, you take a, to make a sine wave, the object is cycle tilde. Um, and I can send it an integer box and tell it like, this will tell you like, oh, that's a frequency. Um, and so if I lock my patch and set it to 440 to give us an A, um, it doesn't sound yet because you have to tell it, hey, I want you to actually like play this out of my speakers. So there are two objects to, the, to do that. You can do DAC or Easy DAC. I prefer DAC because DAC um, actually doesn't turn on all of your patches. Like if you have several open patches, it'll turn on the sound for all of them. Um, whereas DAC can allow you to just turn on this one particular thing. Um, before I do that, though, I should um, just have like a something like that will control my gain uh, so that I know how loud it is. So just go for gain tilde um, and connect these two here. And these are going to be my output. And to make sure we hear sound, we're going to lock our patch and turn on the um, audio. And then we're going to turn up the gain. And we hear our output. OK. And now we're going to erase that. Um, so that was just a small, uh, I guess, intro sort of thing. Um, and so what I'm going to be showing you guys is how uh, I like Hope I remember everything. But basically, I'm going to be using a sample that I have and editing it using uh, Max and then recording that, sam that edited sample and then uh, opening it in an Ableton uh, project. Um, so uh, I already have this here, which will open my file. My file should already be loaded, but just to show you guys how I do that, I, go, I would go here and like find my thing. Ignore, I don't uh, really do folders. I should, but I don't do folders. Uh, Harrison, I'll follow up with you about that. Um, 
And so if you click here into your buffer, you can see that this audio is here. It's a really weird sample, um, and it's literally from Subway Surfers. And I just thought it'd be interesting to like turn something that's like not super musical to something that's at least somewhat interesting. There are some different synthesis techniques you can do, use to do that. I'm not doing anything super, super technical, um, but just utilizing like techniques which are like, so I'll be multiplying uh, different waveforms to the um, initial like sample. Uh, and I guess I'll try and talk you guys through it. Um, I might get focused. I hope I like remember to keep talking. <laughs> um, but so the first thing that I'm going to do is I have to play back what I'm hearing. So we're going to do play tilde, and we're going to tell it the buffer. And that buffer is the one that's saved up here. So it's going to be subway surfers. <laughs> um, and output channels are two. So that's here. And play does not need anything, um, but some objects do need like a toggle to, actually, I'm just going to do that, um, just to demonstrate that um, to play. And um, so we're going to send that to a, an object, which essentially is going to multiply signals. Um, so that's here. And then I'm going to take a phaser. Um, which uh, generates sawtooth signals, as you can see, like it kind of gives you descriptions here as well, which is really helpful. Um, again, I'm and I'm going to make that about 50 cycles per second, um, and then I'm going to multiply these two things together, and so we can like hear the different changes that I'm making. That'll be here, and I'm going to do the same thing I did before with the gain tilde. Um, let me connect these together. Um, and have this here, and that here, and this here, and hopefully this won't. <laughs> I'm going to have that down just in case. Um, OK, we're fine. It's not really very audible yet. Um, and so I'm going to take this, and oh, I also wanted to multiply this by and have this multiplied by, I guess I don't need that right now. There's another object which allows you to have um, basically like time shifting, and I believe that is shift. I'm forgetting what's it, what it's called, sorry. One second. <laughs> um, stretch. Okay, let's stretch till that, and you have to tell it the buffer that you want it to stretch because it only stretches buffers. Um, and so that will be subway surfers. And we're going to send that also. Well, this actually uses bangs to trigger output. And so I will actually have a metro. Sorry, that is a message box. Um, a metro which sends bangs out like at a specific uh, interval. And I don't really need need it to do that many, so like two or something. And I can actually have that um, basically be triggered by itself and just send that a one. I don't think I actually explained what bangs are. Bangs uh, send out a one. Um, and toggles send out a zero or a one. If you know programming, zero is usually going to be your off or stop, and one is going to be your on or your go. Um, so that's going to go, actually, no, sorry. This is going to go here. And as you can see, the bang, oh no. <laughs> OK. I may have broken it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> it's because there's too many going to it. That's my own fault. Let me <laughs> undo that. But see, guys, I'm still learning. So I wanted to try something, and it like, didn't work. But that's OK. Um, I just have to wait for this to, I might have to quit it. But we can bring it back. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, it is like, please stop. I'm already doing that thing. Um, I may have to quit this and reopen it, which is fine, because um, I can quickly rebuild that. 
Um, sorry, guys, don't look at my email. <laughs> Please don't look at my email. <laughs> sorry, guys. <laughs> All right, it's back, great. Okay, so we're gonna try this again. Um, it's a little fidgety of a software, I'll give you that, but I still really love it anyway. Um, and once I get this working, you guys will, will hopefully understand why I do. And let's just like make sure that you guys can actually see what's happening. So I'm gonna do a live.scope, which will let you see uh, various parts of this. And I also need this to be on um, this. Make sure my audio status. OK, that looks good. Um, and so now you see that this is that phaser. And uh, should be able to see. Or let me, con let me finish connecting things, because I don't want anything to break again. Um, so I'm going to want to, again, multiply the signals. So I'm going to want to multiply these two things. So send this information here. And I'm going to send this information here. Oh, wait, let me do cycle tilde, or yeah, times tilde. Yep, to, it's like very particular if you have like signal information versus like uh, just normal message information. It'll get upset at you if you don't uh, make sure that those things are in line with each other. And I'm going to also, there are built-in um, like filters. If you guys know what filters are, they just like basically like attenuate or like bring, they can either like bring down specific frequencies within a sample or like bring up specific frequencies in a uh, sample. So there's like low pass, high pass. This is a low pass which cuts down like uh, high frequencies up to a certain uh, point. Um, you probably won't really be able to hear the difference that much, but I still like to do them anyway, because I like to feel like I'm doing something fancy. But um, OK, so once we do this, we should like hear something. Um, but I could be forgetting something again, because I'm really nervous. <laughs> and like demonstrations are like really difficult to do <laughs> if you're really nervous. Um, so make sure that I see something here. I don't see anything here yet because I haven't multiplied these things yet. And it's telling me something. Oh, I've forgotten a buffer name somewhere. Where have I forgotten that? It's not telling me. Um, I'm not certain where that is, but I will find it. Sorry, guys. I promise this will be cool once I get it working. Um, so what's your first? Let me make sure this is in here. Oh, that's why. It needs a, that reloaded and now this should be good. And I want this to be the time to be um, 20 and I want the this to be loop. And you see that moving. Oh, I didn't show you guys the initial s signal. I'm sorry. Um, that was like probably be important. Um, so the initial sample was, um, I can just take this, disconnect that, and connect these two things here. And it should play the initial sample. Actually, no, it doesn't. All right, thanks, guys. Um, <laughs> thank you guys for your patience. Honestly, I just like am trying something out, trump something new, and like trying to like demonstrate things. 
Um, but things go wrong if you don't have things preloaded. Um, so this is kind of just like working through that. Um, but essentially, I can actually just, if I don't know what's wrong, I can just open up a new patcher. Mm, just do this again. So just replace buffer. So we're going to have a buffer and replace and have a play tilde. And we're going to call this uh, initial for the initial sample and another initial sample and connect these. And we're going to open this here and have this play. Here and here. <laughs> that was the initial sample. Um, if you guys are familiar with that. Um, and the edited sample um, is this. It's not very loud because it's been attenuated a bit. <laughs> but, and in Max you can record sound, so that would be an SF record. Um, and you want to tell it how many inputs, and that's all you really need. Um, and it just takes two messages, open and a toggle. Um, and open, you have to basically tell it where to save the file to um, and what to save it as, and toggle just starts recording. So, oh, also we have to send the signal into it so that it can see the signal. Um, so that's there in both channels. And we're going to open and send it to a folder. This is where I keep a lot of my Mac stuff. So we'll just save this as, uh, I don't know, Subway. And actually, I do that again, because I need to save it as a WAV file, or my laptop doesn't like to open A files for whatever reason. So, uh, and that'll make it easier when we open it in Ableton. I'm almost done, I promise. Um, so I'm going to turn this back on and record that. Okay. <laughs> and then we're going to go to Ableton and I have this project here that I was working on. Nothing really fancy or anything, just very basic. Um, let's turn that down a little. Um, and obviously this isn't a very musical sound, but there is something within Max that there's this really cool convolution reverb device. And this convolution reverb device, if it um, doesn't beach ball me too much, uh, I don't know what I would want to put it on. Let's see. I guess this is fine. Um, let's see. Where do I want to put that? I want it to be very obvious, like this, like tonal difference. This might work. Um, so we're going to go here in our device, and we can load in a folder. And we're going to do our subway wave file. And there it is. And um, if I solo this track um, and I, let's see, make sure my automation's on. Let's do it without first. it into like a more musical thing that you can put in your track. Um, I don't know how helpful this was at all, 
but honestly, I'm just trying something new. Thank you for hearing me out. I think that's like all I've got. <laughs> Okay. Are we done? Yeah. All right, we're done. Thank you everyone for joining us for this wonderful evening of undergraduate art talks with, yeah, we're done. <laughs>